Welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio show. I'm Isaiah Henkel, and today's show is about how crazy ideas can get you hired or help you advance in your career. This is good news for PhDs. Your crazy ideas, that's right, are good for you. Innovation in general is good for you. We're going to go through a very special show me the data section that's going to talk about innovation and how innovation, even the little quirks that you have, and let's face them, you do have them if you don't think you do. Trust me, you do, right? How those quirks are good for you, how they can actually get you hired. Uh, really good to see all of our members with us here in the private chat uh, group. Good to see all of our members here. And I know that we are also on YouTube, so hello. Wherever you're watching us, if you have questions at any time, you can ask them in the comment section and we will do our best to answer them. So again, today is about crazy ideas, how they get you hired, how they can help you advance your career, how they are good for you in general. Uh, we have a very, very special guest on, Safi Bakal. If I'm not saying that right, Lisa, please let me know in the chat box ASAP. Also, Lisa, if you could confirm that all of the live streams are working, that would be fantastic. So we're going to be talking to Safi about his new book. Um, we have a, a great show lined up overall. Safi's new book is Loon Shots. Loon Shots. What a great name, right? We're going to go through his book, why he wrote it why crazy ideas are good. Uh, he's, been on, he's been interviewed by uh, many, many top people, both online and big media. We're really, really excited to have him on. We're also going to be talking to Heather Brown Harding about a new Cheeky Scientist program and about microscopy imaging, how this technology has really taken off. Very innovative technology. We'll be discussing that. It's a great fit for today. And then we're going to be going through in our members only section, resume reviews, talking about job uh, search tips, and talking about LinkedIn. And that's one thing I wanted to mention before we get started today. We have a very special webinar tomorrow, 12 LinkedIn strategies for getting hired in industry. Now this webinar, just like our resume webinar, has been updated for 2019. It has new strategies in it, and it really focuses on creating a LinkedIn profile that'll help you get interviews and help you get high salary job offers. Believe it or not, the words you put in your LinkedIn profile and how you structure it is going to be referred to over and over again throughout the job search process as you're working with the company, as you're going through the, the phone screens, the site visits, they're gonna come back to that over and over again. And what you have in your LinkedIn profile, what it says about you, how you structure it is gonna determine whether or not they give you a job offer and whether or not it is a high salary job offer if they just give you a job offer um, that's lower, which we see happen often with people that are labeled as academics. So what is your LinkedIn profile saying about you? What are your LinkedIn scripts, how you're messaging your activity on LinkedIn saying about you? How are you showing up in search results? All of this will be discussed tomorrow at 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, that's tomorrow, Wednesday, July 25th, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and again at 9 p.m., both live. I'll be on there training you on these new 2019 strategies. And again, how your LinkedIn profile is going to help you get a high salary job offer. Or if you continue to make mistakes, it's going to result in not getting that job offer or maybe getting a low salary job offer that people with their bachelor's or master's uh, will get or lower. Uh, so just go to this page, cheekyscientist.com slash PhD dash LinkedIn dash strategy. By the way, did you know this? There's a separate LinkedIn, LinkedIn Recruiter that employers use. And there's only three things that they search for. If you go to LinkedIn Recruiter, there's three search boxes, three different categories that they edit and search for. You know what they are? Skills, job titles, and locations. And I can tell you right now, most PhDs totally disregard two out of three of those. They'll just use academic job titles that nobody is searching for. They don't put down a location because they think putting down a location limits them. Big mistake. You got to choose one or two top cities. I'm going to show you how to choose these cities, what criteria to use in tomorrow's webinar. Um, also, be willing to put uh, willing to relocate on your on your LinkedIn profile instead of not including any location. Put some locations, willing to relocate. And then again, how you structure your skills, what exact keywords you use for those skills matter. Okay. The search algorithm on LinkedIn is good, but it's not great. You got to use the exact skills that they're searching for not your version of those skills in terms of how you're structuring the word or what you're calling a certain technique. You got to use their skills. We're going to talk about how to make sure that you're using the right keywords there. And that's all tomorrow. Also, for those of you in microscopy or imaging, we have a brand new Cheeky Scientist technical program uh, called Expert Microscopy. 
expert microscopy. You can learn more about it at expertsitometry.com slash Xscope, E-X-S-C-O-P-E dash waitlist. So Cheeky Scientist has been building a technical portfolio. We have a lot of people in industry who want to continue to advance their technical skills, but also people in academia that are getting ready to go into industry that want to sharpen up these skills. We choose the most innovative technical skills, techniques, instrumentation, reagents, et cetera, that are out there. And we're building programs around these. We have one for flow cytometry. Now we have one for microscopy with more coming soon. So you can learn more about that again at expertcytometry.com slash Xscope dash waitlist. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you is the Cheeky Scientist blog. We have so many amazing blogs. Um, the readership has been increasing more and more. Go to cheekyscientist.com slash blog. Look at all of our different blogs. We have a great article out this week. Get hired without submitting a resume. Five networking strategies for PhDs. We've had a lot of PhDs tell us, I didn't even submit a resume to get hired. How is that possible? It doesn't mean a resume can't help you get hired or you can't get hired just with a resume, but this will show you how very often a networking connection or referral can lead to a job offer, certainly to an interview, um, without submitting your resume first. It's a great article. Make sure you check it out. Okay, so we're going to jump to the very first section, the one that all of you love as PhDs, the show me the data section. I'm going to bring on Jeanette with us now, and Jeanette's going to go through the show me the data section, and we are talking all about innovation, crazy ideas, your quirkiness as a PhD, it's your biggest asset, you thought, right, I mean, look at Jeanette, a little bit of quirkiness going on already with the bow tie, um, yeah, so how, how does this help you get hired, Jeanette, I'm curious, before we even get to the data section, why is it important for PhDs to not see the way that they are, right, the you know, always thinking and researching and innovating and all the little things that make them different as a, as a weakness, but as a uniqueness that can help them get hired. What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, it is something that really sets PhDs apart from other people. And in an interview, in any job, like, search setting, you want to be able to set yourself apart, right? That's really the goal. You need them to remember you for a specific reason. And that's something that PhDs have that others don't. Yeah. It also makes me think of the radio show from last week where if you're projecting fake, right, it's not yes. going to work. So you need to go into that, like leaning into your authenticity. If you're a bit of a nerd, right, that's fine, right? right. You don't want to be crazy over the top, but like, it's just don't, don't try to fake being someone else because um, mm. they will know. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's where people get confused because there are some certain areas that you want to grow in, for sure. Like you yeah. continue growing and changing. You learn to communicate better with different types of people, et cetera but you don't change like the core principles of who you are. So you can think like the tactics you change, that's fine. But like the, the, the strategy, the principle of who you are, your, your core values, the, the, these core personality traits, you don't change. So uh, I think that's a good message from Jeanette. So we're going to go to the show me the data section. And this was prepared by Jeanette. A lot of great figures, a lot of great data to go through. The first one is based on the question, are innovative companies more profitable. So the figure showing profit growth is correlated with more accepted ideas, uh, which is interesting, right? So it sounds like the more ideas that are acceptable or just more ideas in general leads to a business actually being more successful. Uh, I'm going to ask Jeanette if that's true or not, but I want to make sure that people listening by audio uh, can understand the figure here. So we have a figure, with a lot of blue dots on it, y-axis, two-year net profit growth, x-axis accepted ideas per 1000 users or people right so as you have more accepted ideas you see a trend it's not perfect but we have this trend line where the where it goes up and the so the profit goes up as the accepted ideas go up what is this telling us Jeanette yeah so I really like this figure for two reasons one that it shows that as there are more accepted ideas which sort of means those ideas which end up becoming successful and are followed through with right it's not just random ideas. They're the ones that the companies decided are worth pursuing. <laughs> right. And right. so you can see that the more of those there are, the more profitable a company can be. And I also think it's really interesting to note that there's a really big divide on this graph where the vast majority of these blue dots are like mm. less than 150 ideas accepted per 1000 users. Right. And then there's these like outliers, these ones where they're generating more ideas and they're getting more like higher profits, right? And so like what, I think it's really interesting to think about like what is separating these people and 
the article goes into it a bit if you want to go look at it. Um, right. There wasn't any fun figures to show on the radio show, but they do discuss like what is this divide and how do they generate these um, more ideas, more accepted ideas per person. Yeah. yeah, great points. And the the article, it's on sloanreview.mit.edu. And there's also one at go.spigot.com. Um, if you've ever done this l simple experiment, if you haven't done it yet, you should. Try to come up with an idea for something, right? Say like, if I was going to solve X, Y, Z, you know, world hunger, whatever it is, and just start writing down your ideas. Everybody thinks their first one or two ideas is the best but try to make a list of like 50 and then go through it and choose which idea you think is best. Give it to somebody else, have them choose which idea is best. Usually it's after the 20th, it's after the 20th uh, thing that you come up with. So we all think that we come up with these great ideas all the time, but we don't, it's like a muscle like anything else. And you just have to get really good at doing soul brainstorming. I mean, obviously in a company setting, you can do it too, but you have to turn yourself into an idea generator and start, be able to turn off that internal editor that I think keeps a lot of us from that kind of creative state, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a very valuable state and that's what we're showing here with all of this data. The next figure uh, is titled, What the Top Innovators Get Right. It's in a stra uh, strategy-business.com article. And so we're looking at uh, a figure here of R&D spending by industry. Lots of lines on a, uh, on a chart. The y-axis has uh, uh, billions of dollars. The x-axis has time from 2005 to 2020. We see a lot of lines going up, two lines staying flat. And the flat lines are like aerospace and defense, chemicals and energy. And then you have from increasing slope, uh, industrials, auto, software and internet computing and electronics and healthcare. Well, I guess software and internet would have the highest slope, but not the highest total. Uh, not the, the highest slope, but not the highest total. Um, so what, is there anything that's surprising about this, Jeanette, that healthcare is the highest, for example? Yeah, it is a bit interesting, right? You would think that, because when we're looking at R&D spending, right, and we don't necessarily associate healthcare with that term, right? right? But what I think is really interesting for us to note is that R&D is just... It's like what the, it's the innovation center of a place, right? So any money spent on R&D is money spent on innovation. Yes. And I, I mean, it was surprising, but then when I thought about it, we see in the like media, so much is happening with healthcare right now. So many changes with like new technologies emerging and the way that healthcare is adapting. So kind of after I thought about it for a minute, I was like, all right, that's right. So there's a lot of opportunity in R&D in healthcare is what that's also telling me. Yeah, and I love how those three things are, almost at the exact same level in how it's indicative of how they've merged, just like you said, like healthcare, computing, electronics, and software internet have really come together. I mean, in big data or whatever you want to call it, but a lot of us don't think about this as being R and D. We certainly don't think about healthcare, the life sciences, physical sciences. Our guest today, by the way, is a physicist. Um, you don't think about these things being at the top in terms of R and D spending. We all think of like software usually uh, in today's world. But it's, a, it's amazing to see where R&D is and how it can be everywhere. Uh, next figure, high leverage innovator performance index. So when compared with the rest of the global innovation 1000 companies, the 88 companies that ranked as high leveraged innovators outperformed, across, uh, outperformed them across most key financial metrics. So really what we're just looking at this correlation of the more innovation, the more successful you are, and in business, these success metrics are what's showing on this, these bar graphs. So average operating margin, average gross margin, gross profit uh, growth, relative total return, operating income growth, sales growth, and market cap growth, all higher, uh, highest in innovative companies. This yeah. is pretty, pretty shocking if you think about it because I think a lot of companies are trained to get really good at something and then just repeat it. Like we hear innovate or die in industry, the same way we hear publish or perish in academia. But there's also this pressure to get your systems right and to increase your margins. And you think that increasing your margins in business, for those of you, you know, for margins, it just means you're bringing in a number of sales and then you have a number of expenses. The lower your expenses, the higher your sales, the greater your margins, right? But if you're, you're bringing in as many sales as your, your expenses cost, the lower your margins, they can, you know, they can start to shrink. Um, so if you can think about it, and it's healthy to think about this stuff as a PhD, especially if you're trying to get into industry, like what is a, what is a company going for? These metrics right here, operating margin, gross margin, profit growth, and what 
drives that innovation. If companies know that innovation is important, who are they going to hire, Jeanette? Uh, yeah, they're going to hire PhDs who they can see <laughs> are innovators. Um. <laughs> yeah, but what, I mean, why is this important? Why, why, it seems obvious, but why do a lot of people forget this, especially PhDs? They don't sell themselves as innovators. They just, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I think we forget. It's, it's like when you're, it's the same thing when you're surrounded by other people, like P, other PhDs every day doing super innovative work, you get down and like really critical on yourself, right? That's also a part of academia is this critical eye that you can carry around with you. And, but if you step out of that setting, you are one of very few people who every day you go to work in the lab, you're innovating every single day, right? That's what we're doing, right? Is mm. creating, you have to add to the body of knowledge, right? That's the whole point of a PhD is add yeah. something brand new, which is innovating. Um, and you just need to realize that that's a huge skill that you need to be explaining to employers, but through the lens of these concepts, mm. right? So by, you can't just say, oh, I was innovative and created five new assays. So what, right? You need to say, why is that important? And these items on this, the screen, you know, all these uh, financial metrics, mm. those are what they care about. Um, so if you don't really know what these terms mean as well like that's something you need to start thinking about like how do i learn about these business ideas so yeah yeah and if you can learn about the advanced technical things you're learning in the lab or as a ta whatever it might be you can learn about the you know the difference in what sales growth means versus profit growth versus gross margin etc and it just helps you like why will innovation push that forward innovation costs a lot which keeps a lot of companies from doing it but the payoff can be greater. That is an argument that you can use to get hired, right? So as you're differentiating yourself, your understanding of the importance of innovation and why it will help the company, you can put that into the context of whatever position that you're going for. Next figure, need seekers embrace strategic alignment. I love this one. I was telling Jeanette before the call and she was probably like, okay, enough, I get it. But what we're looking at here is three different uh, circle charts and it says survey respondents from companies identified as need seekers were much more likely to report high levels of alignment between their business and innovation strategies. So really people that, there's really three strategies here. You look for need, right? And you try to respond to a need and you fix people's problems. Uh, you, you respond to a market, right? You study your competitors, you read those market reports, and then the technology, technology drivers, which are people that just really look for the hottest technology, things that'll, again, allow you to scale, automate, et cetera. The surprising thing here is that people that research the market have the lowest level of alignment, mm -hmm. just a little bit higher than them are the technology drivers, but the people that blow both of them out of the water with high alignment are need seekers. But from your point of view, what does this mean, Jeanette? Yeah, from my point of view, this means that these need seekers who are asking and finding problems that they want to solve um, are there they have this high alignment which is to me associated with that business and innovation being successful together so like that chart we just looked at they're going to have that financial success because they're aligning this innovation and business together mm. which is important you can't be innovating for no reason that doesn't get you money right they have to come together and yes. so it's it's showing that these people who approach innovation with this need seeking idea are those that create the most successful types of innovation. Right. Where is there a need? And then you innovate to fill that need. All right, so I think we have our guest on, Jeanette. Thank you very much. Please thank Jeanette in the chat box if you would. Excellent, show me the data section. And we're gonna move right ahead to our very special guest, Safi Bacall. I believe I'm saying that right. And uh, I'm gonna do a quick bio here. Really excited to have on uh, uh, Safi. Uh, he is a physicist, biotech entrepreneur, and he is the author of the national bestseller, which I have in my office bookcase right now, Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. Uh, he, he talks about radical breakthroughs and really digs into the behavior that leads to these breakthroughs, especially in groups. It's a, it's a fascinating book. I highly recommend it. I'm going to show you the book here in a second. He received his BA summa cum laude from Harvard and his PhD. Did you hear that? He's a PhD in physics from Stanford. He transitioned out of academia like most of you are trying to do. Has been very successful. Uh, he, he's worked with Lenny uh, Siskind in particle physics. 
he was a Miller Fellow in, phys in Physics at UC Berkeley. Uh, after working for three years as a consultant for McKinsey, uh, he co-founded a bi biotechnology company developing new drugs for cancer. It led to uh, an IPO, and, uh, and he served as its CEO for 13 years. He's presented at approximately 130 banking conferences, event, investor events, medical meetings all around the world, um, as well as leading academic institutions in physics, mathematics, medical departments at Harvard, MIT, Princeton, UC Berkeley, uh, a lot of the places that a lot of you are at right now. Uh, very excited to bring on uh, uh, Safi here. I'm gonna show his website. It's his last name, Bacall. I gotta make sure I'm saying it right when I bring him on, I'll double check. B-A-H-C-A-L-L.com has his book right at the front here. This is Loon Shots. Lots of great information. I love this website too. Very, very interactive. Make sure you check out the website and then go to Amazon or wherever you like to buy your books from. Get Loon Shots now. It's a great book. Uh, they have a discount going on. Uh, and yeah, highly recommend it. It is a read that every PhD should have. And very inspiring to see a PhD come from academia to do all of these great things in business, writing a book and, and to continue to give back uh, to other PhDs, which he's doing right now. So we're going to bring on, we're going to bring on Safi, make sure he can start his video. Um, yeah, so very excited to have you on. As you know, everybody that's watching here is a PhD, and it's really inspiring to see somebody who's transitioned out of academia, done great stuff in business, but has still kept the door open to academia and kind of bridged that gap. It's, it's really inspiring. So thank you for all you've done. Thanks. And this is cool. I'm seeing all these uh, messages come in. Nice to know that PhDs can still innovate. <laughs> That's <Yes>. awesome. <laughs> we, are, we are all very clever at our jokes. Um, so let me ask you, uh, because we have a lot of people here who are considering that transition, and I'm sure yeah. when you were in academia that it was a kind of a big decision too. What led to you making the decision to transition out of academia and wanting to start your business and write? Etc. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's, uh, I'm actually really excited to be here because when I went into business for the first time after a couple of years, I was put in charge of a program of helping PhDs and MDs and advanced degrees transition from the academic world to the business world. So this is what I did for a living for a while. Wow. And one of the things that I uh, would start by saying, there were a couple of things I would start by saying, but one is that the way I would describe it to folks, the transition, having, I, don't think I set foot off a university until I was about 30 years old. I grew up, uh, my parents were both scientists. I grew up on the campus of Princeton University. I worked, all I knew was scientists. And I just got very curious, like what happens in the rest of the world outside a university? And I remember I was dating this woman at the time and she was working in an office and I was like, wow, that sounds interesting. What's an office? What's it, what exactly is a job? I don't understand. Can you, and I was literally, you know, 28 years old. So she took me into her, she was a paralegal at the time and she was working in a law firm and she took me in on a Friday afternoon. I remember going around and asking folks, so could you tell me what you do? And they're like, I really can't describe it. I'm like, are you happy? No. Are you happy? No. <laughs> literally, I went around and asked 15 people, like, are you happy? And they were all like, no. I was like, that set me back. Wow. That, kept me, that kept me in academia for another couple of years. But what no. company was this? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to mention any names. Yeah, yeah. Um, the way I describe it to folks who are scientists right now or considering the transition is being in academia is like going to a gym and exercising your left bicep for year, like a decade, for 20 years. You ha may have the best left bicep <laughs> in the world or one of the top five left biceps in the world, but the rest of your body is kind of flabby. And the transition to the business world, in a lot of jobs, you really are problem solving in a similar kind of creative problem solving hmm. way. But you need to exercise much more broadly all of your muscles. You may not have the best left bicep in the world. You may not be the specialist in multivariate differential equations. Hmm. You certainly won't be needing that in the business world. But you will learn all sorts of kind of fascinating skills, how to motivate people, how to work within teams, how to influence folks, ups, down, lefts, right, how to solve problems quickly and effectively and efficiently, uh, how to structure problem solving in very new ways. So it's like the difference between going to the gym and just exercising one muscle and being a much more broad athlete. So that's one thing I like to say. A second thing is that you are playing a very different kind of game in the business world, in the academic world. And the way to think about it is this, it's speed chess 
versus regular chess. And in the academic world, love that. In the academic world, you have, in some sense, infinite time and limited resources. Especially if you're in a PhD, it will seem like infinite time, but very limited resources. In the business world, it's flipped 180. Mm. You have, relatively speaking, infinite resources, but limited time. Mm. It's the same kind of problem solving and creativity and trying to figure stuff out. Similar rules of the game, but because of those constraints, it's a very different game. You have to learn how mm. to solve problems quickly, solve them at the good enough level, not the perfect level. Because the, the third thing that I tell people uh, that they need to understand when they make this transition is what is valued is different. The rules of the game is different and how you win the game is different. In academia, the goal is originality. Your track record, your career, your publication list, for example. Hmm. In the business world, the goal is results. The goal is results and it's not at all about you, you, you and your career, it's about your team. Hmm. People care about your team and you and how you're able to motivate people, why? Because you want to create new things. Let's say you want to innovate or be an entrepreneur. You want to create new products. It's never about an individual. Someone can have an idea in a shower, but that's about 0.1% of it. The 99.9% .9 of it is getting other people excited about your idea, developing market strategy, all sorts of things, product strategy, manufacturing strategy, sourcing strategy, customer strategy, revenue strategy, and implementing all those things. So that's 99% of it, and that requires a team. Mm. So whereas in academia, you the focus is on your original ideas, in business, the focus is, it doesn't really matter where the idea comes from. You know, Google was not the first search engine, Facebook was not the first social network. It doesn't matter where the ideas came from. The Google AdWords product, which turned them into a trillion dollar company, was developed by Overture and GoTo.com. So what? Nobody knows and nobody cares. A trillion dollars later, wow. that's what Google is worth, right? So it's totally, whereas in academia, it would be all about the originality, right? Mm. In business, it's just about results. And so that's about, it's similar to the difference between me, 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 and my career, my publication list versus the team and our results and our impact. So that's, that's wow. a, in a nutshell how I think about the differences between the two worlds. Well, that's the best nutshell I've ever heard because, um, yeah, I think you really nailed it. We talk a lot about the differences, and um, that was the best description that we've heard of it. So thank you for that. Yeah, I can tell you, yeah, you've definitely helped people transition before. <laughs> you definitely get the differences. Wow. Um, I want to turn to your book and talk about it a little bit. Uh, our whole team, you know, ended up, or a lot of them ended up getting a copy and loved it. Uh, you know, we love this idea, of course, as PhDs, too, of, you know, the crazy ideas and leading to breakthroughs and that it's actually a strength. Sometimes, especially as PhDs, we think the way that we're wired is a weakness and we kind of shelter it. Maybe academia teaches you to do that, but I like how you talk about it being a, a big advantage, especially in groups. Um, and so I wanted to ask you just why you wrote this book. I, I always like to know, you know, what, what drove you to do that? after all of your success? Why, why write this and what were you hoping to, you know, other people would get out of it? Sure. Well, roughly, it was about 18 years ago, I started a biotech company and we were focused on developing new drugs for treating cancer. And a few years after I started the company, my father uh, unfortunately got diagnosed with a type of leukemia, rare type of leukemia. I figured, well, now I'm in the field. I have access to all the latest science and technology and experts and I can do something about this. And um, I couldn't. No matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. And my father uh, passed away a few months later. And over the years, subsequently, I kept noticing through all of my time working with small companies, large companies, medium companies, how many promising ideas hmm. for treating my father's type of indication or other types of cancers or other severe diseases were trapped in the basement of small companies or large companies, but just buried and stuck. And my motivation for writing the book was, what can I do beyond one product or one company to help larger group of teams and companies and even nations liberate those products that can help 
improve the world, improve the lives of patients. And so that's why I wrote this book. No, it's inspiring. And um, it's a very strong reason why. Thanks for sharing that. Um, in the book, you talk about a lot of exciting things and turns of phrases. And you have this one that's called uh, listen to the suck with curiosity. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about what that is and how it might be relevant to PhDs? Sure. And in fact, it was a PhD. Well, actually, it was an MD who I got that from, who was an incredible scientist and researcher who would have won the Nobel Prize had he lived a little bit longer. But it was a guy named Judah Folkman, who was uh, chief of surgery at Children's Hospital in Boston. And as a young guy, he came up with a new way to treat cancer, block the blood supply feeding tumors. Hmm. And at the time, he was not only not taken seriously, because the only way to treat cancer at the time was chemotherapy, which sort of poison tumors or radiation, which is sort of burn them. And people said, yes, yeah, the idea is nuts, you know, blood supply, what are you talking about? Mysterious substance, it's, you know, causes tissues to create new blood vessels, that's crazy. And eventually there were ups and downs, like all sorts of research, ups and downs and ups and downs. And at some point, the Wall Street Journal published a headline after some people came out and were attacking him saying, noted uh, cancer researcher stumbles as other labs fail to reproduce his results. And that, you know, can be a career ending kind of thing. Irreproducible data, especially a national headline. Wow. Most people react the way most people would react to to adversity like this or people rejecting your idea, whatever you're working on. If you're an entrepreneur, you're working on a new project. If you're a scientist, you're working on a new idea. When an investor rejects your pitch or someone rejects your idea or a partner walks away, your initial reaction, if you poured your heart and soul into it, is to dismiss. Ah, these people are idiots. They don't understand. They don't know. That What are they talking about? And you seek reassurance from, let's say, your friends, your mentors, your mother, that you're on, on the right track. And what Judah would do, and I found this so typically in so many successful scientists as well as entrepreneurs, is they would take off that defensiveness hat. I mean, they might wear it for a few minutes and you know, Judah would rant privately to me like, oh my God, Mike. but then take it off and put on something more like a Sherlock Holmes hat. So what Judah did in that particular instance, unlike others that might you know, publish something or write an angry letter, is he called up the guy who did his experiment, who tried to reproduce his experiment, said, hey, could you walk me through you know, with your postdoc or your students, step by step what you did, I just want to understand. Mm -hmm. So they, he sat down with his student and the other guy's student, step by step until they saw where something was going wrong. And they uncovered that in shipping and freezing down his protein and shipping it across the country, there was some leakage from the package just in the freezing process that was contaminating the protein in kind of an interesting way. Uncovered the problem, solved it, began working, got a lot of credibility and learned a bunch of new things. So LSC, listen to the suck with curiosity. And here's why I add that curiosity, especially because if you're in the business world, if you're in the business world, you'll often hear stuff about blah, 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 active listening, blah, 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 you know, which basically means repeat what you've heard. Well, that's not good enough. Like if someone is telling you your stuff sucks, your, this doesn't work, this doesn't make sense, I'm not really going to buy your product, I'm going to walk away. If you just say, I hear you, thank you, and move on, you've lost. Why? Because there's a little, there may very well be, if you pull on that thread, and that's not easy, because people don't want to really give you that information. But if you can put on that Sherlock hat and say, could you help me understand? I know that's not easy and it's asking a lot for you to take your time and something, you know, it can be a difficult conversation. People don't want to do it, but it'd be an enormous favor and gift if you could just walk me through your thinking. Hmm. And sometimes when you pull on that thread, you'll find a nugget of gold. You'll learn something like, hey, well, there was this competitor in, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, a Belgium who has this other product and it has this feature. And you're like, wait, what? Really? Yeah. Feature? And you're like, it takes you, you know, two hours to reprogram or do something or meet that need and you, you have a win. Or this guy said, you know, I was fo following all along here and then I got lost right there and then I just gave up. And you're like, oh my God, that's so easy to fix. So LSC means listen to the suck with curiosity, get rid of the defensiveness, forget all that active listening 
just try to uncover why. That, once you do that, if you get very good at doing that, you can identify those little gold nuggets that can make either your idea in science or your product or your service, if you're an entrepreneur, succeed. You can turn it around. And so I actually think of the great, the scientists that I've worked with, who are the Nobel laureates, the greatest inventors, innovators, entrepreneurs, their skill was less about coming up with new ideas. Their skill was in investigating failure. Hmm. Everybody can have ideas. Most of the time they fail. The truly great ones keep investigating those failures and that's where they learn something useful. Fascinating. And um, I think for PhDs, they have both of those elevated. The, you know, the, the kind of dismissive defiance at the, you know, the initial, but they also have that extreme curiosity. So if you can just switch that gear, which is like you said, not easy, but that's a great insight. Um, I also wanted to ask you about another part of the book, which I think you just hit on mind the false fail. Absolutely. Help us understand this too. Yeah. Those tie together. Mind the false fail is a lot of companies or groups will give up prematurely when they, because they encounter a failure, but it's the wrong kind of failure. It's a failure in the experiment, not in the idea. And here's what I mean by that. And I'll give you an example. When uh, Mark Zuckerberg was taking Facebook around to investors in 2004, almost all the investors passed. Mm -hmm. Why? Because at the time it was the 20th, 30th social network and none of them had ever succeeded in making money. And the conclusion, the widely accepted conclusion was that social networks are like fads. Somebody starts them on, they go to another one next season, they go to another one next season, like clothing fads. Hmm. Because, and what reinforced that was right at the time, there had been a very popular one called Friendster. Mm, that's right. And people were just leaving Friendster and jumping on the next one, MySpace. So investors were like, ah, oh, look, none of these things ever make any money. Forget it. Hmm. One guy named Peter Thiel, and Ken Howery was working with him as kind of research guy who is a friend of mine. And they said, you know, let's really investigate if that is the case. Are these really bad business models? Are they really like, you know, social, uh, are social networks like genes? <laughs> they knew people at Friendster and they knew that their website was kind of buggy at Friendster. So they got the data and asked, let's see how long people stay on this website. And they found out that users were staying hours on this Friendster website, this social network, and they realized, whoa, they're staying hours despite the fact that it's a crappy website and it's crashing all the time. Mm. Who would want to do that? Obviously, these things are really freaking addictive. Yeah. So Peter Thiel wrote a check for $500,000 and he sold it eight years later for a billion dollars. So wow. that's how Facebook was an example of a mm. false fail. It was the false fail of Friendster. It was a flaw in the experiment. There's a, that's a business world one since you have a lot of science PhDs. I'll give you a very short one. Yeah. Just, the statins, which are drugs that lower cholesterol, Lipitor, they've saved millions of lives. About 50 million Americans take them. They've revolutionized uh, heart disease. The first time Akira Endo was a scientist who discovered it in Japan, tested the statins. People, he gave it to mice and it didn't work at all. Almost everyone gave up. And that was like the second or third failure because other you know, dietary interventions didn't work. And then you try a drug and he begged permission to try this drug and he tried it in the mouse model in the lab and that didn't work. And that's it. Like everybody else in the industry gave up. But he persisted. He persisted. He met a guy at a bar later who worked with chickens and he said, oh, chickens lay eggs and eggs have a lot of cholesterol. Maybe it's a problem with the baseline cholesterol. Why don't you just give this drug to the chickens? Boom, home run. It lowered the cholesterol of the chickens by 50%. What happened? Statins only lower LDL, bad cholesterol. And mice only have HDL, good cholesterol. Oh, geez. Wow. So, every, so the statins huh. are about a third of a trillion dollars in <sighs> revenue, cumulative revenue. Everyone in the, else in the industry gave up on owning wow. a piece even a few percent of a third of a trillion dollars is a lot of money. Everyone else gave up on that. Akira Endo did not. Because of that, 10 million lives roughly over the last 30, 40 years have been saved due to the statin drug. That's an example of a false fail. 
It's a good idea that failed in a bad experiment. I love it because it's kind of, it's a different twist than just, you know, never give up. It's almost goes back to the curiosity thing. I mean, really, Absolutely. you're, you're, stu are you studying the right context the right part of this? I mean, Absolutely. it's a very, very kind of, yeah, like a scientific researcher point of view uh, to approach it much more calmly. And it kind of conflicts in business because like you said, it's speed. So uh, being able to do that is uh, pretty rare. That's, that's great. That's a great story. Uh, I know we're running out of time here. Last question. Do you have a favorite saying or phrase you want to end with? Maybe the Jude Folkman story? Um, you know, absolutely. Actually, Judah told me a line. Is We worked together for about seven years, which has always stayed with me. And I asked him one time, how did he persist for 32 years with this crazy idea that everybody say he was asked to resign from his, 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 his chief of surgery position? People, you would get up at conferences and like everyone would walk out of the room. He said, everybody seemed to have to go to the bathroom all at once. So he, he was kind of ridiculed. And I asked him, you know, until in 2003, a guy stood up and at, a, at the biggest cancer presentation in the world, pressed a button on a slide and showed that in the largest trial ever conducted to that time in patients with advanced colon cancer, the drug built on Judah's ideas, extended life, extended survival more than had ever been done before. And there was a big standing ovation. And the speaker actually said, oh, if only Dr. Folkman had been alive to see this. Judah was actually in the audience, in the back, and turned to his friend and just smiled. <laughs> he loved to tell that story. That's but I asked, I asked Judah, how did you persist for you know, three decades when people, all these experts who are you know, well-renowned people tell you this could never work, your idea is flawed? And he told me, and it's always stayed with me as I've pursued my own crazy ideas, there are no experts of the future. Hmm. Well said. Well said. Thank you very much, uh, Safi, for joining us. And it's Safi, right? Safi Bacall. That's right. Safi. All right. Thank you. And uh, everyone, please go check out Loon Shots. I'm going to show it again. Please tell Safi thank you for being on. What an incredible interview responses and uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you for all Thanks your a lot. Thanks for having me. Take care. Okay, thanks everyone. Please do me a favor one more time. If you haven't, tell Safi thank you in the chat box. Uh, very, very inspiring. It's great to see what PhDs like you can do um, just when you shift your mindset, right? That's really what he was talking about is just seeing industry for what it is, how it's different than academia. Neither is good or bad in one sense. It just depends on what you want to do and understanding it and changing uh, and being curious about it, right? It's amazing how powerful curiosity is uh, in response to attacks, in response to uh, uncertainty where to start, in response to like any feelings of rejection, uh, it, it always wins out. You just have to be able to switch that gear. So really, really impressive. Uh, I want to show his book one more time and do me a favor, reach out to him, sign up on his website. Let's give him a big thank you, show him our support. We don't get to see many PhDs out there doing big things in business, IPOs, uh, New York Times bestsellers, but not as many as we, we should, right? We were still down at that two, 3% level. We, we want to get it up to 51%. So check out his website, B-A-H-C-A-L-L.com, and then get his book. If you can find him on LinkedIn, you can put your email address here. Uh, tell him you're from Cheeky Scientist. Let's show him uh, our support. Okay, we're going to move forward now. Again, excellent interview. Um, I want to move on to our next guest. So one thing that we have been developing or innovating at Cheeky Scientist is a portfolio for technical programs. We have a portfolio of career programs. Uh, and we thought, you know what? Let's, let's help PhDs do what they do best. Let's help them innovate. They get into industry. You still have to stay on top of your field technically. And we've been really interested in the highly innovative fields where, where things are, are progressing rapidly, where really cool things are going on, uh, things that allow for um, you know, research and, and, and clinical research to, to move forward fast. We got into flow cytometry first, imaging, microscopy next. Uh, and our next guest is a program leader for one of our newest technical programs, uh, expert microscopy, uh, Heather Brown Harding. Hi, Heather, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, good to see you on, and uh, I appreciate you being here. So Heather is currently the uh, a director of Wake Forest Microscopy. Uh, she has got her PhD from the University of Florida in microbiology and immunology, 
Um, after uh, graduate school, she joined Zeiss Microscopy uh, as a manager there. Um, and I think worked with MIT and surrounding institutions as well uh, as part of that. And then she started working on this microscopy program, which took, geez, was this like over just two, two years to develop this program? It took a little over two years from our first conversation. A little over two years, right? So uh, very in-depth. I mean, like all the programs at Cheeky Scientist, we were a lot, we, we, we go deep, right? Very thorough, and we realize it's lifetime learning. So finding the right program leader who's an expert and getting the material together and making it uh, a living, breathing thing that continues to advance uh, takes time. Um, so the, the, the program's incredible. And I wanted to bring on Heather briefly here to talk about, you know, why? Why did you get into this? Because, you know, like Safi, you had this bug inside of you where you wanted to do something more, right? You wanted to create something you know, kind of like uh, what drives a lot of people to start their own business or write a book. You kind of did that together in this, in this course. So what, was, what drove you to, to want to t take on creating a program? So while I was still at Zeiss, um, I attended a women in science and technology um, mixer to kind of meet other people. And um, I was surprised that just out in Worcester that there were so many people that um, didn't know how to use their microscope. Um, and, you know, that's less than an hour to Boston, one of the biggest places to like be able to get into science um, in the world. And, you know, they didn't, um, their university didn't have someone that was their microscopy director. They um, didn't have classes to take and they had these perfectly good microscopes, but no one knew how to take a picture, let mm -hmm. alone get actual quantitative data out of this. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, that's when I reached out to Isaiah and was like, how do, how'd you start this cheeky scientist thing? Mm -hmm. um, and that's when we decided that maybe a collaboration would be our best move forward. And I was just very motivated to be able to get access to uh, people throughout the world to be able to do quality microscopy, to not be afraid of getting on your microscope and to have confidence in your images, um, as well as just being able to get through your projects faster. Some people, I obviously, I have a extreme love for microscopes, but not everyone does. Some people just want to be able to know what they're doing, get through it and move on to their next thing, especially when you're in industry, when you have such a small amount of time to get things done, you don't wanna spend all your time troubleshooting an experiment that you could just, if you had just a little knowledge, you'd be done. Mm. Um, so with that, that's why I really put in a lot of effort to take all the ideas of microscopy. There's a lot of physics and chemistry um, in um, microscopy, but uh, you don't need to know every detail, but bringing it down to a level that someone that's say an upper level um, undergraduate would be able to understand was my goal so that we could get as many people as possible using their microscopes right and we can have more pretty pictures as well as good data in, um, in papers that we were seeing going out. Um, I'm sure that you've read a paper that you you just wonder how did this get past the reviewer? This is terrible. Mm. Yeah, no. And I think what's amazing about your career and your experience in microscopy is, you know, you have that industry experience and the academic experience. So like, you know, everybody here, you've, you've transitioned or people here that have either transitioned or want to transition. So what was that like? What, what did you learn in industry? What were some of the differences you saw? I just thought to ask this because after our conversation with uh, Safi, um, what was what was the why did you transition and then you know what were the differences you saw yeah so um before i joined cheeky scientist um i didn't know about the program yet and i was desperate to get out of my postdoc it was just not a good match it was paying terribly outside of boston <laughs> so as everyone here that hasn't transitioned knows he's just so desperate mm. and i was able to um I took a class on how to improve my, or change, it was called like CV to resume that my um, school had put on. And within a week um, of updating my LinkedIn profile, I had a recruiter from Zeiss call. 
And my first response when they wanted me to be an account manager was, well, but I'm a scientist. Like, cause I had imagined all along, I was going to work on, on a bench at a company. Mm. You know, I wasn't really going to change things. It was just going to be at a company and make some money. Yes. Um, but then, you know, with my love of microscopy, I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, why don't I do it for one of the best companies in the world? Mm. And I actually, I had a lot of fun, but, um, the lifestyle ended up not being for me, um, traveling so much. Um, but I just remember when it, like, this might sound crazy, but one of the things was, um, we, our company car was this big SUV. <laughs> and go into Cambridge and parallel park that thing into a, a small thing and, and, you know, just feeling accomplished. You're like, I am more than just a scientist. Um, and then, you know, the scientist part of you, you do more consultative sales. So you try mm. to figure out what their actual problem is mm. and solve it for them. So you're still using all that knowledge that you've gotten over the time in your PhD to just solve different problems. Mm. Uh, as well as it, things that may not be remotely late, related to science, you know, just figuring out, okay, well, this demo machine needs to be here and I need to do this because of this timeline. Um, so doing the job actually made me much more confident and um, yes. just feeling like I am more than just a bench scientist. Um, and so, um, you know, when I was leaving, I still wanted to be intensely in microscopy. Um, and so that's why I took the, um, the position um, at Wake Forest. Hmm. Um, I wanted to get up my experience so that uh, I could, you know, start my own business. Um, and so right now we have the expert microscopy um, that will be opening up again shortly. Um, and we'll see where it goes from there. But, um, yeah, it was a lot of hustle outside of normal work time. Yeah. And I think, um, what I love about your story, your transition is it just shows that sometimes we limit ourselves. We're like, well, I can't get into industry. Well, if I get into industry, I certainly can't do anything with academia ever again, or I certainly can't start a business or I can't do all these things at once, but you can, I mean, you've heard from Heather here, you heard from Safi. I mean, the, those borders are just uh, mental, right? You, you can, yeah, and you can. You do get a little pushback because um, one of the things that I got the pushback on was, well, you were, you were doing sales. I know you were making six figures. Are you okay not making six figures in, in, in academia? Well, I can do this for a few years. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you have to be prepared for these questions of why would you take a pay cut or things like that if you're going to go back and forth. That being said, because I have my foot in both doors, you know, it gives me a lot of maneuverability to do what goes for what's best for my life at the time. That's exactly the, I think the key takeaway here and a great closing point. Maneuverability. You all have much more maneuverability than you might suspect. That flexibility right now, you think you have very limited options. You can only do this. You got to erase those limitations. You can do, keep your foot in you know as many doors as you want uh, as a phd you have that strength uh, starting a business industry academia many people do all of them at once in one way or another uh, heather safi included so heather thank you very much for your time great to see you. you congratulations on the program yeah connect me with, with me on linkedin if you're interested in seeing more yes so thank heather in the chat box if you would and i'm going to show the the opt-in website here i know lisa put it in if you're interested in learning more about expert microscopy, you can go to the expert microscopy waitlist page, which is at expertcytometry.com slash xscope dash waitlist. So expertcytometry.com slash xscope dash waitlist. I'll show it on the screen here one more time. If you're watching in the live stream or on Zoom with our members, the, the link will be put there in the chat box for you. We'll also include it in the post show notes. So this takes us to the end of today's radio show. For those of you who are looking to transition into your first or next industry job, we do have a very special webinar tomorrow, just as a reminder on LinkedIn profiles. So I'm going to pull up that page too, one more time and show it to you. This webinar is 
tomorrow, Thursday, July 25th at 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll include this link in the chat box too. Today's your last chance to sign up to get an early seat for 12 LinkedIn strategies for getting hired in industry. We only have 500, only 500 people can come to each time slot. So you definitely want to sign up if you're interested in coming. And then you need to show up early because it's not just the order that you sign up, it's the order that you show up. So make sure you show up so you can join us live. 12 LinkedIn strategies for getting hired. We're focusing on 2019 strategies here. We've updated this presentation to really look at what you need to put on your LinkedIn profile and what activity you need to show in order to not just get interviews, but get high paying job offers because the job market is in your favor right now. Thank you all who are watching us on the live stream for watching us and uh, make, make sure you stay tuned for another radio show coming up soon. If you want to learn more about Cheeky Scientist and our flagship program, the Cheeky Scientist Association, just go to phdsgethired.com phdsgethired.com. As always, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional. Goodbye to YouTube and goodbye to you too, YouTube. That's what I meant to say. All right, it's just us members now. Great to see all of you on. So we have a very special members only portion show as well. I'm curious though, for those of you still here, what did you think of Safi? I think it was very, very inspiring. I think we should have really leaned into the... Uh, fact that he has transitioned. Um, I don't think, I think if uh, more of the associates knew that, uh, we would have really blown the doors off of the attendance here. It was really surprisingly good and, and surprisingly, uh, I think it resonated with all of us. Uh, very smart guy, very articulate, but also um, relaxed, right? <laughs> it's uh, easy to understand. And I, I think that's the comfort that you get when you know who you are, uh, crazy ideas and all and you um, lean into it. We had a show me the data section that we didn't get a chance to show. I actually wanted to go back to it really quick. I'll just show it here because it talked a little bit about these uh, qualities that you have as PhDs um, that are highly valuable and that we don't get to uh, you know, really celebrate as much. If anything, we I think we try to water them down a bit. So the important, it's under this uh, article titled Importance of Hiring for Innovation. And it's a, it's a Forbes article, but it's, it shows, it says, look at the methods and processes behind the professional. A candidate with innovative traits will love to learn, presenting some of the following personality aspects. So this is stuff that employers are reading. Who do they want to hire if they're trying to hire for innovative roles? How can they identify people who are innovative, right? The PhD is a, you know, a, a big indicator, but what else are they looking for? Some things might surprise you. Uh, if you're eccentric, right? Guess what? A lot of us... PhDs are eccentric, okay? I mean, it's not just the way that you might dress. It, it's also just the way that you act, kind of the general quirkiness. The fact that you are the kind of person that likes to decrease the margins on a document, right? Nobody else does that but PhDs. The fact that you can get lost researching something that doesn't even really matter, but you just all of a sudden want to learn everything there is to know about oak trees. And so you just dive in and you're researching for two hours. Who does that, right? PhDs, that kind of curiosity um, can be seen as eccentric, which is innovative. Visionary insight, boundless curiosity. I just talked about that excitement for new ideas, right? If you get really excited when something comes up and everybody else is just like, well, this won't work for this reason or this reason, but you're, you just start talking about more and more ideas. Have you ever had those conversations with somebody else? It can be really exciting. That is a valuable trait. An eye for details. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times, especially when we were starting at Cheeky Scientist and it was like just me writing a blog article, whatever else, we'd send these out and I would have a hundred emails telling me about every typo that I had in a blog article. You might, you know, uh, think that this is a bad thing, but this is a good thing. The fact that you have an eye for detail, you catch everything, you know, we try to shift it to be a little bit more positive instead of just hammering somebody for, you know, something that they don't present correctly on their slide, but it is, it is a valuable trait. Uh, a nerd for nuanced hacks and processes, right? Every time you learn to do something better, new or innovative, like that excitement that you feel again here, it's a, it's a rare thing. Not everybody feels that. Multidis multidisciplinary skills, this is actually, uh, has become a thing. When I was in grad school, uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary PhDs weren't really a thing. It's a big thing now. Um, I would say that all of us are multidisciplinary. Creative approaches, hobbies and skills, unafraid to ask what if, 
what if? And I think that's a great approach to have as you go into something new, like your job search or learning about an industry, instead of putting up your walls and thinking that you know everything, which is very natural for a lot of us, saying, what if? What if this is true? What if everything I thought about this was wrong, right? This is how paradigm shifts happen. It's how you become more creative, more innovative. All right, so we're going to jump into transitions. Transitions continue to skyrocket. I think this month, we're really close to breaking our record. We had 18 in one week this month, which is incredible. Um, I think we're well over 30. I don't know what our last record was, maybe 40 in the month. But congratulations to Maximiliano, who's now a field application scientist. Congratulations to Manish, who's a senior scientist. Adwait, who's now a medical writer. Dignesh, regulatory affairs officer. Kelly Andrews, senior development scientist. Bapi, an industry position. We'll try to get more specific with them. We're trying to get their job title from them, but they did transition. Congratulations, Bapi. Congratulations to Rachel, business analyst. Helena, scientist. Saikat, staff scientist. Michael, project leader. Kareen, industry position at startup. We're also trying to figure out the job title there. Aparna, promotion, second industry position, clinical scientific expert. And Kerry, protocol project management. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to our Cheeky of the Week, Mark Grossman. We actually have multiple Cheekies of the Week since the last radio show. So Mark, congrats for sharing and thank you for sharing a high value job search insights or your high value job search insights, as well as how he made critical mindset shifts and what strategies have and haven't worked in his job search. Congratulations, Mark. And congratulations to Samuel, Samuel, if I'm saying that correctly, for supporting fellow Associates asking questions and sharing learning experiences with our community. Thank you both very much for giving so much back to other associates and, and for being so active in the group. We often see those who get cheeky of the week soon after get job offers because when you engage, you learn better, right? The best way to learn is to teach and to support, add value. You get a lot of value in return and it just helps you hold you accountable in a way. And it helps, you know, uh, the, the self-justification a uh, feature that we all have in our brains where if you're giving a lot to something, you're going to really go after it and you're going to hold yourself accountable to your job search and you're going to reach out to more positions. You're going to follow up, network more, get more referrals. And that's why we often see the cheeky of the weeks get those job offers soon after. So congratulations. Okay, so I think, are we bringing Swati on now? Is Swati coming on the show? We have, we, I was just showing her radio show post. I think I forgot to ask if she's coming on. She is coming on, right, Swati? Well, now's the time. Let me make sure I can get your video on. And Swati had this question in the group. Is it just me who feels being from physical sciences means I won't get a job in a market full of opportunities for biological sciences? Does anybody else feel frustrated and useless? I really appreciate when you associates share your frustrations. Obviously, in the association, we're big on being solution focused. That doesn't mean you don't talk about the problem, though. Um, and, and I really appreciate you bringing up that problem. I think it's perfect to have you on and Swati, it was no coincidence that we're bringing you on the same show that we had a physicist PhD who transitioned into industry, started a job. I mean, just so inspirational. It was even inspirational for me and I'm not in physics, um, but hopefully it was inspirational to you. What did you, what did you think of having Safi on? Oh, you're on, I think you just got to click the little microphone button in the bottom left. Or maybe all of our, are all of our guests? No, Heather was on without the audio issues. It looks like you're unmuted. Let me see if we can get Swati on here. I can't hear you. You can hear me okay? Now we have the reverse problem that we had with Safi. Swati, did you allow a Zoom to access your audio? Let me see if I make you co-host. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. Try pressing that little mic button in the bottom corner and then unpressing it. Maybe that'll work. Let me also check my, no, my audio is fine. Can anybody, can anybody hear uh, Swati? Type in yes or no. Nope. Okay. Thanks, Mario. I know you're right there. Maybe just try signing off and trying signing back on. That seemed to work for Safi. We'll give that a shot. So how many of you, and then why we, while we get Swati set up here, I'm going to ask you, how many of you f have felt at one time or another that you were limited because of your background? 
right? Maybe you came into the association and you had a very specific background. Maybe it was like a non-life science background. Maybe it was like a humanities background. Maybe it was a very specific type of life sciences or physical sciences or STEM or non-STEM. And you thought, wow, I just, this is really holding me back. So Verena says me, Sur, Surya says me, far be it. Well, what's your background? For those of you who said me, Katerina, Baros, Shantanu, what was your background? I think this is a very common thing. It's because we, we lock in to that, like uh, Safi said, our left bicep so much. Your, the left bicep metaphor, that's your background. It's a very specific background. You're like, I have this background and it's a massive strength in terms of how much I know in that field compared to most people in the world, but it's also a massive liability, right? And you think like, oh, that background is all I have and it's not really needed in industry. I'm not trained anywhere else, so I'm at a disadvantage. But you have to realize, like Safi said, everyone in academia coming out of it has that left bicep problem. It doesn't matter what your background is. It's the fact that you have specialized in a background that is your problem. But everybody has that problem, and it's, you can easily overcome it by training the rest of your body, so to speak, right? By training your other skill sets. So look at this. We have people that are microbiology, immunology, cell biology, humanities. Every one of you thinks like, oh, my specific background is a weakness. No, no, no. Everyone's specific background is a weakness in your job search. That's the whole point. But it doesn't matter because it's equal. It's equal on the playing field does not matter. So it's so easy to think like, oh, somebody with their background is more highly desired or their background. No, it's not. It's just these, it's all the same general skills, your ability to research, speed of learning, data analysis, or just analysis in general, right? If you're not analyzing data, but you're analyzing research, those are the main skills. Your background doesn't matter. And you heard this from Safi, if somebody as successful as him is saying it, it must be true, right? Uh, but that, that's, the, that's the issue. It's not your specific background. It's the fact that you have a specific background that's a weakness. Everybody has that coming out of academia. Focus on your other skill sets. Focus on the things that actually matter. And, and this is the, you know, the same thing that I was going to tell uh, Swati. And if we get her back on a little bit later, I, I will share that with her. And you just never know, right? You just need to change your perspective. I love that. Swati's question was about being in the physical sciences and thinking that, oh, because I'm in the physical sciences, I can't transition. Um, and, and sometimes you just need to have a mindset shift, which data helps. And so we gave her data. We said, uh, actually, we've had hundreds of associates in the physical sciences transition, right? And we have over a thousand people in the association in the physical sciences. Um, you just heard from Safi, somebody who's highly successful, best selling book starting a business, transition to industry, does all this stuff with the physical sciences. It's not, it doesn't matter. Your background is uh, independent of your success in industry. So hopefully that makes sense. We'll see if we can get Swati on later. In the meantime, we have something else in store for you. We're going to go through a resume, Mark Grossman's resume. Mark, are you on with us? He is on with us. Mark, you should have came on live. We got to get you a webcam. It's okay. We have Mark here. So Mark asked a great question in the group, which I'm showing here. Uh, this, oh, this is his resume post, but he also asked a really good question about resume formats. And we thought it would be really good to discuss on the radio show to help you all frame these tools that you have. So we teach you a lot of different things. And all of the things that we teach you are tools that you can apply to specific situations, especially when it comes to your resume. So we've been talking a lot recently about a functional resume because we've really seen it work for people. What that means is if you have no industry experience, you're just highlighting your academic job titles, maybe try highlighting your technical skills or transferable skills instead in your work experience, and which is a functional resume format instead of a chronological resume format, and seeing if that gets you somewhere. Mark brought up a good question saying, well, you've talked about functional resumes, you've talked about other resume types, you talked about transition, uh, transferable skills and the bullet points. How do I bring all this information together for my benefit without contradicting, you know, uh, uh, things like what's the best, best practice. And so we focus on best practices, but we also want you to, to allow for some flexibility. For example, 
if you're talking to somebody at a company in an informational interview and they tell you exactly what that company wants, throw what we say out the window and do exactly what that company wants. We have best practices, but there are outliers. And if you get more insider information, apply that or take what they said, right? Like maybe they say they really only want two bullet points in a professional summary, or they really hate that transferable, that technical skills list at the end or whatever it might be. They really want things not indented. They really want three pages. They really want one page. They really want publications. Great. Take our best practices, add that onto it. Have a little bit of that flexible mindset because that's, innovation. That's what's going to help you, right? Innovate what you're doing for that specific situation. Mary, any, any comments on that? I know you, I know you definitely have some thoughts on this. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You have to tailor your resume to the job description and to the hiring manager, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so yes, by all means do that. But also we see sometimes people um, in the group say, oh, well, my friend at this other company did this for their other job. So just really be careful about who it is that's giving you this advice. Um, it's always well-intentioned, yeah. um, but just get as much information as you can. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up too. Like if you heard specifically from the hiring manager or an employee at that company, in some cases a recruiter, about what to do for a specific situation, then do that. But if you heard like, oh, this one recruiter said that this is always the case. Okay, first of all, as a PhD, you know if they're saying it's like always the case, it's just not true. Right, so uh, consider your source. We're trained to do this as PhDs. How credible is it? Um, consider the context of the source. Okay, so are they talking about this one job? Or are they trying to give you a blanket statement that suddenly you have to change everything you're doing for every job you apply to? I guarantee you, no matter what one recruiter you talk to, or one hiring manager, whatever, like our best practices are way better than theirs because we just have a way bigger reach. And we have dealt with more PhDs and more hiring managers, recruiters than they have, right? So our end value is just way higher. That's not arrogance. It's just data. It's just science. Um, however, right, if they say, oh, for this one job that, you know, this company that I work for, that I help fill jobs for, et cetera, I know they want this. Now they're the expert. And so that I would definitely listen to what they say. Does that, does that make sense to all of you? Can you put a yes in the chat box if that helps clear it up a bit? Um, really good point from Mary there. And just, can I just add something? I might yeah. be going off topic and we'll come back, but I think, okay. um, you know, making sure that the information that you have doesn't have too much technical jargon and it has numbers that they can recognize is sort of, you know, that's something that you should be con really concerned about. But then once you have your resume draft, don't dwell on that too much. Make mm -hmm. sure that you're networking and getting the resume into the hands of a human, not an ATS, right? We always say yeah. that. Um, because then, you know, formatting and everything is, is a little less, uh, you know, um, limiting. Yeah, yeah the, f the fine details don't matter if you're not doing the broad strokes. Like, and it's a, it's a comfort thing. As PhDs, we get really comfortable, you know, in these small spaces where we're figuring out exactly how to adjust the margins or the format or exactly what to put at the beginning of a bullet point. But you're focusing on something that's going to move the needle barely, if at all, when you haven't even done the huge thing that's going to move the needle the most, like get a referral or network or ask somebody at that company what they want to see. Uh, so really try to focus on those big strategic things, which can be harder to do, uh, I think, for PhDs. Uh, great, great point. Um, that being said, let's look at this resume. I think Mark's resume is, is great here. Um, he's, he's using, you know, one of our association templates uh, he's, he's indented things a bit, which I love because people skim resumes. So they do it from top to bottom instead of reading left to right. Lots of white space. I like a little bit of bolding too. Obviously that jumps out. So I just wanted to address it very quickly. Um, it's a personal taste a little bit, but I think when you're skimming something, why not just bold the stuff you actually want them to remember in seven seconds? What do you so think? On that, I mean, also keep in mind if you, you know, sometimes we have to put a resume in online through an ATS and those bold, that bold text is going to be weighted he more heavily mm. than non-bolded text. So if it's in the job description, that's definitely a hint that you should make it bold. I think something that if you are going to use bold text, I would get another opinion to make sure that you are in fact bolding the, the words that should be bolded. 
because sometimes we see resumes in the group where they've bolded something that, you know, might not be the, the most important piece of information. So. Yeah, I agree. And um, for the visual center, a um, couple of things that jump out at me. One, for your LinkedIn URL, great job putting it there. But Mary, I'm guessing you saw this, you thought this. Yeah, and, and Mark already commented in the uh, chat box that he removed the extra digits from the LinkedIn URL. Is that what you're, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. I noticed that right away, yeah. Yeah, and some of you might not know this, you can change your LinkedIn URL too. So of course you wanna move the extra digits because that's like a UTM code that just tells the website where you came from. Um, other times the digits are there because LinkedIn just does it by default. Yeah. So you can actually choose what LinkedIn URL to have and make it a lot shorter. Um, the summaries, you know, again, the format, very tight. I love it. Um, you know, the first, uh, first bullet point, I'm always looking for numbers. Like your first bullet point has got to have quantified results, right? I, I very rarely would I say don't have something there. Cause you just want to see like, look, I did this. I got a result. Don't worry so much about what the results are. I love the uh, results and the other, the other two. I love that you even included revenue. Amazing. in the third bullet point, I love that. I would almost move that to the top. You know, if you can't think of a good one for what, uh, I, I know that you're looking for car T-cell positions, right? Mary, Mary and I talked about this before the show. If you can tie somehow that revenue to the car T-cell stuff, you can make it stronger. But that's, that's you know, it's kind of nitpicking, but I definitely would like to see a quantified result. Mary, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. That first bullet should have that. And, and I see the word T-cell, T-cell, T-cell three times there, four times. So I would maybe cut back on that. I know... I mean, these could all be terms from a specific job description, but I would, um, it's a little bit, there's a little more jargon and not enough number, I think, in that first bullet. Yeah, or just like, you know, for the second part, say T-cell receptors and T-cell immunology signaling and therapy, right? You can shorten that quite a bit, yep. which is yep, yep. removing those. Uh, the next section, this will be interesting because I, I have very, you know, I don't like to date myself I just don't. I don't like to say, like, hey, I've been doing this for nine years because immediately I'm getting this resume and I'm like, what, this person's been in this one academic position for nine years? Like, why did it take him so long? I, I don't understand what, you know, I don't, I don't get that. And I'm, and I'm a PhD. Like, I think a lot of the recruiters and hiring managers, it's just confusing to them. And the T-cell immunologist, I actually like that. I think that's a great phrase if you're going for car T-cell obviously. I love that you put that instead of postdoctoral researcher or any of these kind of generic terms. So really good job there. Um, it's basically like putting a skill there, but uh, just being more specific because again, you're, you've targeted this very, very well. Um, quite a few bullet points too. I like them. They're very well organized. You're clearly leaning into what the people are going to care about the most for these car T cell industry positions. Um, yeah, I don't see any major issue. I just, you know, I, I, I'm going to look at like why this is so long. Uh, that's, that's the only thing, but I, I that's a small issue overall. I think it's, I think it's good. What do you think, Mary? Yeah. I mean, there's some people that just want to see the dates, you know? Mm -hmm. So again, if you can know ahead of time what the person wants, but I, I think if you have all of these different skills and all the accomplishments in these nine years, well, I mean, yeah. maybe that shows like loyalty to a project or a team, right? If you're accomplishing a lot in that time. Uh, anyway. And just be prepared. I mean, they're going to ask you, mm -hmm. well, so what did you do for these nine years? There was no job title change in nine years. And that's where it's going to come out that this was a postdoc or a training. For grad position. school. Yeah. Grad school, and you know? just a minor detail, I would bold T-cell immunologist. Yeah. If you're bolding these down here, I would definitely yep. bold the subtitles. Good point. Um, yeah, I mean, really, I really love that because uh, a lot of people will bold the uh, different sections of the technical skills, but then not put them at the top. I like how this is organized. I mean, aesthetics really matter. You get somebody who organizes something very tightly and formats things perfectly, and you just think that they have their, their stuff together. It's just a fact. And, and uh, I think you've done a great job here. Um, yeah. Honors and awards. Anything you'd like to see there, Mary, or anywhere else? I mean, those are great, but if you have data like, you know, top two, top percentile or, or you know, top yeah. student out of 50 or something like that, um, just to give results a, a little bit more weight to it, I think that's great. Um, 
I'd like to see a hobby. Yeah. I know you have some, Mark. I know you do something, right? I know you have some hobbies. So put that hobby in there. Just show that. Because by the end of the, the resume, if it's all about the academic stuff and the awards, it's the same thing. That, that differentiation, we heard that from Safi. We heard that from, you know, Jeanette and show me the data. That's such, such, such a crucial thing. So um, go ahead. Can I go back to just so, you know, measurable results? We, we always bring them up. And I know Mark asked, um, this is related to it when Safi was on. He said in the chat box, how do you convince a hiring manager if you're innovative, if you don't have a patent? Like, I guess these measurable results and, and owning them and being proud of them um, is something that a lot of people struggle with and that came up in conversation. So, you know, he said, the hiring manager can't see the protocols that I've troubleshooted. So uh, like, ha yeah, th this is something that these, these measurable results are going to help give you credibility for. And I'm not sure what else to say. I mean, Mark's done a lot and, and yeah. he can own, own these things, so. Yeah, and, and Mark, I promise you that in our in R and D, it's not some special outside of humanity thing. Okay, hobbies are not uh, distracting. Oh. I think they would be. Um, I definitely think having a hobby or something in there is going to be valuable to you because if somebody, the person reading this, even if they're the head of a lab, it gets passed to hiring manager, recruiter, and it's head of a lab. That person transitioned to industry for a reason too, and I promise you, they are not all about lab only i promise you they want somebody well-rounded because you have to work in a team and if you don't yeah. even have a hobby they're thinking you are not going to be a, they're not you're not going to be able to work with a team you heard that from safi a physicist yes. right you got to be able to show you can work with a team you got to show you're you're human you're well-rounded it's not a distraction yep you need to carry conversations they have so many so, I mean, my husband's at some kind of retreat for his company right now. They, a lot of them work in different offices and they're together and they're doing team building. And I can't remember what it was. He had to bring like um, sports clothing, you know, so there's, it's, it's going to be part of your job. I mean, depending on the company culture, right? Right. Um, and they do, you know, a lot of companies will do fundraisers or team outings for things to get, you know, publicity and to build teams. So this is something... Um, Definitely, it's involved in the actual work, but they also want to know that you have work-life balance, right? Yeah. It's, um, Mark, do you do yeah. you ride a bike, Mark? Have you ever ridden a bike? Do you walk to the lab or classroom? Do you eat different types of food? Mark used to bike. Okay, so biking or enjoys time outdoors. Yep. I mean, honestly, that's all we're looking for. Nothing creative. Like you don't have to be like a famous painter or anything like that. Um, if you like different, honestly, if you like different types of food, you can put foodie down. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's important for you to see yourself this way too. <laughs> You're more than just a, a researcher. You yeah. are human. You do things, believe it or not. Um, you, you, can find, you can find a way to put enthusiast after something. Like you don't even have to do it to be an enthusiast. You just have to like it. Like you can be a toothbrush enthusiast. It doesn't matter. You just think of something that you're enthusiastic about and put enthusiast afterwards, right? You don't have to actually have done a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. No, you hear all the time. Uh, they look at your resume and then if you're brought in for an interview, part of what they want to see is that they can, they can work with you and talk to you. Right. Star, Star Trek. Trek. Absolutely. Mark, do it. Put in Trekkie. Actually, Tim, t yeah. Tim's one of our uh, other program leaders and he loves Star Trek too. And he started mentioning this in his teaching and people loved it and you would never think that they would, they would like this. Um, and this was, this was an, in, uh, industry teaching. So, um, yeah. there we go. All right. So thank Mary, please. Uh, thank Mary in the chat box for her time. Good to see you, Mary. Yes. Good Great to see work. you too. Thank Thanks you. For your expertise. All right. We are almost out of time. We have Swati on. I'm going to see Swati if I can get you on and uh, kind of recap what we talked about for your question and see if you have any, any questions we can answer. And then we are going to wrap up. All right, I can hear you now. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. So I did talk a little bit about your concern for having a specific background. Yes. Did you hear that part at all? No, I was actually trying to uh, install Zoom. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. So just to recap, remember how Safi, were you on when Safi was on? Uh, yeah. They talked about having like the world's strongest left bicep. Yeah. Right, because that's how all academics are. You, you have a specific background and 
a lot of us as PhDs get focused on what that background is, and we think that that's what's holding us back. But it's not your specific background in physics that's holding you back. It's the fact that you have a specific background. Yeah. Every PhD has a specific background, and the fact that you've specialized so much is what you have to overcome. It doesn't matter if you've specialized in life sciences, physical sciences, anywhere else. You still need to do the same exact thing. Focus on transferable skills, develop things that aren't in that specialty to, to develop the rest of your body in terms of the metaphor and to transition. Um, so yeah, I wanted so, to follow up and ask your thoughts on that. Yeah, so uh, the point is like I work in a specific field of fluid dynamics. I usually uh, work on microfluidics and then I do a bit of rheology and uh, yeah, most of fluid dynamics. So there have been like uh, many jobs that I have seen the job description. So the point is like, if I am, if I have, I am an expert in rheology, then there is some polymer chemist also who is also an expert in rheology. So all the jobs where I can apply, they will get a polymer chemist who knows chemistry plus rheology. So they would prefer to have that guy as their employee. So these are the, the, you know, the problems that I'm facing in my job search. And in microfluidics too, I have an expertise in microfluidics, but then they will also have, you know, there are people who are working in biology and they are experts in microfluidics. So the company would rather have someone who has some idea of biology and the microfluidics and they would hire them. So no, no, I appreciate that. And so what you just said is yeah. all based on assumption and no. completely, completely no. wrong. Like if you've heard it from a couple of people, that's okay. But I want, I'm telling you, what you're thinking, the, what you're focusing on is the wrong thing to focus on. Okay. So what you, maybe you got some feedback from a hiring manager saying that they would rather hire a biologist. Is that what happened? No, 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 no. Nobody said it to me, but like in the job description, they would say, okay, rheology plus polymer chemistry. So I don't know polymer chemistry. Oh, okay. That's even easier to address then. Yeah. Job descriptions, they're just templates that are reused. Most of the time, they're hiring managers and recruiters who don't even know what those skills are, for the most part, that are just posting them. doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply. It doesn't mean that you can't get that position. And what you said is, is still an assumption. You're reading something where they're saying, we prefer this candidate or we want them to have this. And you're thinking, wow, they're going to hire somebody else with the chemistry or the biology over me. Yeah. And so that's making you feel rejected and that's holding you back. It's just a very... Uh, it, it's a very, I don't want to say negative, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very challenging way to approach your job search. Instead, just have the assumption, because if you're going to be assuming, you might as well assume in the positive direction. Why not assume they're actually going to want a physicist? Why not assume they're going to want you because you have better communication skills? It's not the technical skills that are going to hold you back. I'll tell you right now that if they had somebody, if they're really looking for somebody with fluid dynamics, a fluid dynamics background, yeah. they're going to care less about whether it's a, biology based or chemistry based or physics based fluid dynamics background and they're going to care more about having that background from whatever source and also being able to communicate effectively also having leadership skills also being able to do all of the other soft skill stuff that most PhDs simply can't do would they rather have a physics person with fluid dynamics experience who's a great communicator and gets along very well with everybody and follows up and has already had informational interviews with people on, uh, on their staff, or somebody with, in chemistry who's not gonna get along, who hasn't talked about their transferable skills at all? Which one do you think? Yeah, I mean, they would rather have someone who is an expert in fluid dynamics with transferable skills and yeah. good in their team. You seem, you, seem very, you seem saddened by this. No, no, I'm <laughs> tired because of this game from now. No, no, it's okay. I just, so I just want you to think about it from that point of view. You know, instead of focusing on your weaknesses or where other people might beat you, so to speak, focus, yeah. as on, focus on where you can win, right? Work on your strengths so much that they outshine any weaknesses and control the conversation in your resume, in your interviews, et cetera, by focusing on those strengths. Most PhDs will not take the time to highlight transferable skills, to dig into which transferable skills are important. Yeah. You do that, you're going to put yourself much further ahead like don't compete with them where you're equal yeah. right either you're equal or what you're saying is they're better in fluid dynamics because of whatever reason but it's like on a scale of this much you're focusing on the, yeah. these very small things that don't matter focus on the broad strokes like the fact that these people have no transferable skills but you've really articulated yours and you've really worked on yours and you're 
you've really shown them you're a great communicator and you've reached out and you've built connections. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try to do that because I was actually uh, looking to the looking onto the job descriptions and they say, okay, preferably biologist, preferably chemist. So I'm like, no, this job is not for me. But now that you have told me that it is a template that they use over and over again, so. Be fine. And this is why I posted because all the jobs that I see is like either chemistry or biology. I'm like, where should the physicists go? <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely apply. Yeah, they probably are just reusing templates. They probably didn't realize that the field of physics has this specialty right now. I mean, they're yeah. they're, they're not produced by PhDs in most cases. Those those templates. So I would definitely still apply. Yeah, now I know. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on, Swati. Great to see you. Really appreciate it. To all of you watching, we'd love to have you on the radio show with your question too. It's always good to talk and, and to address those concerns in, in person uh, rather than just the, the, the group at times. So great to have all of you on. We're a little bit over time. I want to quickly bring on Mary, Jeanette, and Lisa. Ask them what they enjoyed the most about Safi's interview. And then we're going to wrap up. So I'll have all of them come on. I think they can jump on here. There we go. Can I just add something to what Swati, yeah. um, her situation? And I know this isn't the case for everyone. So, okay, we go through academia, we're experts in our field, and we want to make use of those skills and the findings and apply them to industry. But I wonder also if some, of, some people's struggles is that they don't know what else they can do out there. Mm. And that you can do so much that's unrelated to your work that can be just as satisfying, like more satisfying, right? We have people that are in that program video games, we have people in real estate, we have people working like user experience research, all these sort of things that you can do that aren't bench research. So yeah. just something, you know, maybe this doesn't apply to Swati, but uh, something to consider. Yeah, great point. Don't pigeonhole yourself as having to find a job that says on the job description, your specialty, because you're going to severely limit yourself. Good points. Okay, Lisa, I'll start with you. What did you like about Safi's interview? When, when he could hear us <laughs> yeah he i think we got him on uh what did you think uh, about his different uh metaphors stories uh well he had, he had a, yeah so he, he he did a um he did a great job of communicating both to us as an academic as well mm -hmm. as an industry professional and to to translate the um to translate to like to work as like the mediator between those two sort of different worlds and and that's um that's also what we try to to get all of our members to do for all of you cheekies to try to do the same thing when you're communicating yourself your academic abilities to um present yourself as an industry professional so it's the same sort of um you're working to do draw the same sort of bridge which is because we've had a couple of posts in the group about um, and, you know, Mark was one of, one of uh, somewhere along the line, I think. Um, but to talk about yourself as like the functional resume and, and to talk mm -hmm. about the transferable skills. And that's what that, the purpose of that is to work as like the mediation between the academic world and the industry world. I love it. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, he, man, he just knew how to, that first sequence where he talked about the differences and how it flipped on its head and just fantastic. Jeanette, what do you think? Yeah, I really enjoyed his uh, listen to the sec with curiosity. Mm. Um, that is brilliant. And just a really cool way to put that concept, right? <laughs> so you like heard about like when you get negative feedback that you need to take off that defensive cap and listen. It's the only way you're going to ever get any better at anything, right? Yeah. And um, but I really like the way that it was put and to think about it, like just really like try to understand where that what they're thinking, like what happened Mm. where is this disconnect, right? Because you clearly don't think this idea sucks or that you suck. Right. So you just like approach it with curiosity to figure out where that disconnect is happening. Mm. And then you can go back and like work on your idea or your project or yourself and figure it out. So I like that. Yeah, completely agree. Mary, how about you? Or, or pitch the idea to somebody different because maybe it's not you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. I think sometimes we get feedback from other people and, uh, they're like, no, this is a good idea. But you hear it from one person and they can, can either shut you down or make mm. you angry, right? And, and maybe try to avoid that. Yeah, just like the N is N of one, right? No matter what situation you're in. Jeanette, you want to say something? Yeah, because I still think that's valuable input, right? Yeah. So that person's negative oh, yeah. feedback. Yeah. You shouldn't just disregard, oh, it's just that's one true. person who thinks it's a bad idea. 
why are they not understanding how great the idea is? <laughs> yeah. No, no, you're right. And yeah. That's what, you know, and I guess that's what we were trying to talk about with, it's very different from just don't give up and move on to the next person to why is this really going on? However, I want to caution all of you as PhDs. <laughs> it's very easy to get stuck in analysis paralysis. For example, you reach out to somebody on LinkedIn, they don't respond or you don't get, you go after that job offer, they reject you. It'd be very easy to really try to dig in and figure out why, but maybe they're just, they're never going to respond to you. Maybe they're never going to tell you. So there's got to be a point where you're like, okay, I'm letting this go. And on the scale of how important this is, right? Where is it? Yeah. You're a new innovative way to fight cancer and people are rejecting it, even though you know it's working a little different scale than you're trying to get feedback on a job. So just figure out how much time to invest, but at least ask why once, right? So good stuff. When, when, one quick additional thought on that one, it can also be a lesson in your, your method of communication, like yes. you're on the broad. Cause if, if, if they're not, if they're not receptive to your idea and you know, it's a good idea, maybe you need to tweak how you communicate it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a tough lesson for, for me <laughs> and blog writing, especially, but uh, <laughs> really good insights. Really good to see you all. Thank you. Please thank all of our team members in the chat box, if you would, for those of you that have stayed to the end. Thank Jeanette, Mary, Lisa. Thank you. Do we have a swag and, winner? And we do have a swag winner. I'm guessing. Who is it? Neela Barros. I may not be saying that right. but I think we only have about 25 of these left, and we're never making any more. So if you show up to the radio show, we should put this in the group too. 25. Because this could be, I mean, it could be like 20 years later. And Cheeky's, you know, as big as Amazon. And then these are like collectibles, right? Mint condition. Um, maybe unlikely, but we really are not making any more of those. So who won? Nelia? Nila. Nila, congratulations. You get one of the last remaining Cheeky journals, the last remaining red ones. We're going to have new ones, but they're not going to be, not going to be with the same design anymore. Congratulations, Nila. And last but not least, we will take a song request. I've told team members that they can't secretly request songs because they snuck in. You can request them, Mary, if you want to. I'm just not going to choose them. <laughs> well, it's, it's on our uh, team playlist, this one that I just requested. We had Amy sneak one in from No Doubt like two, <laughs> two radio shows ago. I thought it was a, Amy the member, not Amy the team member. Um, this, oh, Silver Lining. Mary, you, you, you still got one in first. You're welcome, Swati. Any songs? 1990 or later? Okay, if I don't get one, I'm just going to choose what we have here. Top 40. What's the song you just listened to on the radio? How about that? See what's going to happen? Everybody's going to be quiet, so I have to choose Mary's now. I got to eat my words. <laughs> Mary. Oh, jeez. You guys are all in this together. Uh, first aid kit. Which video should I do first? Like, that's right. right after this previews. Here we go. <laughs> 